so uh, yeah looks like i think most of the people who would be joining have joined and then the rest can just continue later so hey all uh, firstly i'd like to tell uh, tell everyone that i'm actually recording this because i'm thinking we could probably make a podcast out of this or something and yeah hey everyone to permissionless learning uh, basically i started this because i wanted to learn more about what people are learning nowadays and how they are learning new things so uh my the first clubhouse meet that i held it was supposed to be on react but turned out that people wanted to learn more about other things also like career growth and space tech and other technologies so i decided to hold this part of the meeting like the second part as a general space where we could talk about interesting technologies that people have been learning so uh with us today we have pratik who has been learning augmented reality and virtual reality outside of his regular job so uh i wouldn't say he holds a non technical job but he holds a job where he doesn't have to actively learn these things but still he has he's taking the time out to learn them uh he also started learning figma recently because he's interested in building his own products so i think he can talk about all of those things we have madhavi with us uh, who is uh, who works uh, with space ta- space tech startups and she has done this without uh, you know without having to wait for the permission of a university or some employer to tell her to start building things on her own so i think she will also have a lot of experience with space tech in india and all of that to talk with us and uh well you guys know me <laughs> i like to learn new things so uh, what i had been learning recently was how react works internally so if we get time uh, i'll talk a little bit about that but mainly i want to focus on all of you guys and everyone generally gets a chance to speak here so everyone is expected to speak i mean not really expected but it's good if you speak about what you've been learning recently but yeah uh i guess i'd like to start with pratik so pratik you uh, tell us about i guess your experience about learning about ar and vr from scratch you don't have an experience in ar vr yet you are learning so what courses have you been following or like what pathway are you following for that yeah so uh, i have started basically like you know the search engine and the best tool for you to start with and uh, you know i'm not uh, I, i didn't find any specific course that would uh, fit my uh, curiosity or fit my specific interest about what i'm planning down the line uh, going forward i might search a specific course on the augmented reality or virtual reality but for now i'm just using the open sources uh, open sources and the knowledge and the articles blogs videos whatever i find i so it has a knowledge and then i go forward collectively uh to make it more interesting why are you learning ar vr like you have, you can learn about a lot of things but how does ar vr help you personally yeah so i would say uh there <laughs> there are two things um uh, interest and the opportunities so when i talk about interest uh things that i like things you know that i feel i can uh, produce down the line or things you know i can create and that would be that would be creating an impact in the emerging market uh uh i have an opportunity basically through this interest to uh, create something out of nothing and that is i'm definitely i'm definitely sure that people will find it attractive basically ar or vr is uh is such a thing you know where you are mixing the reality with the virtual reality and people always find this amusing and amazing and uh, if, if you see you know it is it's like a lucid thing so uh, it, it's like a lucid dream so uh, uh, things that you know uh, uh, you always wanted to uh, get in touch with you always wanted to imagine you always wanted to dream 
you can actually activate without practically having to build something out of it so basically that's my interest and when it comes to opportunity uh, I will I will just throw some figures and that might again I miss each one of you so right now uh, this industry is standing at 30 billion dollar of market size 30 billion 30 billion dollar is a huge it's, it's a huge figure and it's predicted to be a 58 billion dollar by 2022 and then 296 billion dollar by 2024 which is 1000 percent of what is current size of my of what is current market size of the year we are and uh, just to tell you just to add a, into this uh, the current CAGR that is the compound annual growth is 35 percent and to talk about India or Asian Pacific country we are contributing 37 percent of growth to the current market size and the current CAGR so that's a part of opportunity that, that I was talking about and right. incremental growth is 125 yeah sorry all right uh, sorry so yeah I was about to say so uh, can you get into the specifics of why you're actually I mean uh, so you're uh, primarily learning this to apply it somewhere right so can you talk about where you intend to apply this knowledge perhaps there's a product you are building or something that you're working on so uh, I won't specifically talk about what I'm working on what I'm building I think that won't be a right uh, way to summarize it but I would say that uh, uh, for any startup or uh, any individual uh, before considering uh, you know uh, that uh, uh, where, we, we, where we can use this air we are to build something out of nothing we need to break down the macro we need to break it down to the macro technologies which could be creating impact and we need to consider the practical cases uh, the practical cases would help us to structure how air and we are would play a major role in the current time right so can you talk about some of those use cases like how I mean uh, 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 what uh, basically what you have talk, talked about till now was theoretical knowledge but practically where do you see an impact of AR and VR in startups or you know uh, just in some general apps so actually I would like to later on throw this question out to the audience also but uh, personally to you since you've been learning it so you might have more knowledge about it than the rest of us mm -hmm. it, so all right so i think yes uh, this question is pretty focused so what i do is i'll share some example is that okay so share some example where startups are using this technology and what are the upcoming uh, trends <coughs> that makes sense yeah yeah all right so uh when I when I talk about you know this example, people usually imagine that I'll speak I'll speak something fancy like we saw in the Iron Man or we saw something in Star Wars, but let believe me, this AR VR is not quite there yet. It has a lot of limitation and yet it's, it's expensive. So, but although that is the case, if you uh, if you observe carefully, more, we are already using AR VR around us. So use cases are you know the uh, let to uh, just to start with very very basics. Uh, when you use zoom uh, the background gets blurred and that's just the basic of it but you know that is using uh, that is a uh, element of VR the virtual reality where you know uh, it's adding something to the product value few days back uh, there was a game in the gaming basically it was a disruptive gaming uh, move in the gaming industry the game used to call the Pokemon uh, and it was basically you know we wanted to catch some real-time Pokemons yeah using the map I think you're talking about Pokemon Go right yeah exactly yeah so although it was ahead of time it was basically not only AR and VR but it was MR which are which is a mixed reality so which is a next level of AR and VR right and there are two three very important use cases like uh, Aid tech industry, educational technology industry, they are start, they have started using uh, AR and VR for the interactive educational models. So this helps students and the parents to quick 
quickly and grasp the concepts uh, understand it thoroughly which is practically not possible using the books or using the blogs or the articles yeah so yeah okay so then you know the live educational and interactive models another another recent example is lenskart uh, which is online e-commerce company uh, they are using uh, a ar module uh, basically where they are cal- they are measuring your uh, uh, the dimension of face and eyes they are relocating it in the back end and they are uh, generating fit to glasses module and on the screen you can see how particular glass looks on to you what is suitable what is not suitable you can change the color you can change the frame on a live basis so you just scan your face and you actually get to know how it looks like on you instead of directly wearing it without wearing it you know actually how it looks after you wear it right so yeah, and uh, example yeah. yeah so actually uh, i mean uh, one final question for you i guess are there any unconventional use cases of ar and vr that you haven't yet seen in the market and you'd like to see like any app that you regularly use uh, so can you tell me the name of any app that you are using regularly just uh, for ar vr or uh, yeah so any uh, any app so uh, see I, 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 yeah so uh, most of the people know snapchat and instagram and they not they might not be sure but these filters are elements of ar and vr right so if anyone is deeply interested into this they can deep dive into how snapchat is uh, working on this filters how are they creating this ar engines how are they creating the cores in the back again these are basically assets what we saw on the snapchat filter these are basically right assets. right uh, assets. but uh, that's a existing solution what i'm talking about is uh, what would you like to see which which is not already there yet basically right so okay so there is a to, to tap about the potential market i would say uh, the fashion industry uh, okay uh, any particular app in mind there there are no apps right now on this and i think most of the apps are in the research phase okay uh, the, what, when i say fashion industry uh, that means you know no everyone has no access uh, to the fashion shows or uh, trying different different fashion elements such as clothes such as different different ornaments right. this app would definitely help you to access this then there are live events and there are interactive educational models which can be implemented via ar and vr and obviously most importantly the gaming industry right right yeah i think what you talked about the fashion industry was a interesting unconventional way i mean what i was imagining was maybe since you talked about those fashion shows there could be a way of having mixed reality like you being present there without actually being there like uh, controlling a camera for example i think some uh, sports uh, games like football are already doing this but yeah bringing this to like non sports events would be quite interesting uh, actually uh, madhavi do you want to say something you're you are muted yeah i had a question for pratik so uh Uh, this is regarding the simulation market that we have currently i mean what are your views of uh, using vr in the sim- for simulations for example i'll give you an example uh, so pilots are trained they're trained on field and also there are simulation trainings given uh, as a part of the curriculum so what are are your views on using vr technology for those simulations Uh, make use of ar and vr so uh, uh, coming back to your specific question uh, 
so when it comes to simulation it's not only limited to AR VR this is a part of extended reality which is called as XR <coughs> so a pilot would not only be able to imagine uh, the environment around his specific shuttle or specific bogey but you know he can actually interfere with this uh, uh, with this environment that is created virtually around him uh, sorry have, Pratik uh, I guess uh, sorry to stop you there but I guess you meant interface right yes yeah I mean I, I think I'm I, huh? sorry yeah continue yeah I mean interface I think I use some other word yeah. and then uh, yeah, I mean, yes, rightly. So I was saying that they would have access to uh, basically the environment around them. So environment, Akash, when I say that, so that means, you know, they, we create a specific situation around us, a live situation. Right now, most of the situations are uh, module-based situations in the, uh, in the uh, example that Madhvi was talking about. So, you know, uh, it comes to the wind, different, different models of wind, uh, different, different situation around the environment like air pressure like certain obstacles maybe all of a sudden turbulence etc <clears throat> right so this situation and then you know uh, responding to this situation on a live go all right yeah that's that would be quite an yeah, interesting that, that makes sense thank you So yeah, so there are currently uh, extensive simulation models uh, that uh, all the space in the, uh, companies make use of. But in addition to that, something that can, uh, you know, AR, VR could bring those th 2D simulations into 3D. Uh, they could transform as a 3D product. So I think that would uh, be useful to visualize any errors or uh, possible uh, failures in the system. Right. Uh, can you uh, go into more detail so we can imagine what you're talking about? Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, this happened uh, very recently. The seventh or the eighth uh, trial of the uh, Starship. Uh, of the, the SpaceX uh, rocket that was launched. Uh, so they were testing the uh, they, they were testing the flight and uh, the landing of the rocket. So it was successful in launching and landing, but it failed uh, somewhere in the uh, propulsion system. Uh, something leaked. So in that case, I think virtual reality would uh, help us in knowing uh, beforehand that uh, this could be the possible uh, failures that would happen. You right. Know, something by like uh, by running a simulation of it beforehand, you mean? Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah the two D simulation into three D. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, so I, I'd actually like to go in reverse order now uh, with the audience. So I guess, uh, Shramik, uh, since you were the latest to join, uh, I would like to ask you, like, what, uh, I mean, what unconventional uh, way can you think of implementing AR, VR, like any app you use generally, where you would like to, I mean, like some features of AR and VR? Yeah. Um, all right. So before I even start with any of this, I'd like to, like, give a shout out to you guys, because it's not often that I get into AR VR discussions um, any any time since so it's all it's nice nice to have uh, a room full of people talking about this uh, and yeah so there are very there are a few non conventional things that popped into my mind that I could use uh, augmented reality with um, given given the fact that I'm assuming I'm I'm right about augmented reality here so I'm thinking I could use this in in the interior designing. Uh, side of industry wherein you'd want to see your house with some furniture, some cabinets installed or 
some of the pop that you could put into your house so you just wear in a goggle or take or take your mobile phone switch on the camera go into your app and you go through the room you'll get multiple options you'll see that okay i could have a beige couch here i could just pick up and put that couch at couch at one corner and see if it fits there um given the fact i don't think the tech is there yet where it you would be able to see how exactly it would look like but you'd get an idea and i suppose that would be a start for some of the non conventional applications of augmented reality out there right wow that's actually super interesting that you brought, brought that point up because uh, we have uh, prasad oswal with us right now who works for a company in norway which does the exact same thing i think uh, not the exact same thing but something quite similar so <laughs> Prasad would you like to talk about your work and what i mean how your company uses this ar and vr technologies uh he- okay hello everyone am i audible yes you are yeah i think i can hear you oh uh, okay so uh, i mean uh, the company which i work in right now is not exactly in ar vr but we we are trying to visualize 3d models of construction buildings and allow users mm-hmm. to make their work efficient in different calculations okay so it's not exactly ar and vr but it's quite related in terms of software so okay. in technology stack we use uh, i mean react for the front end with 3 js which is quite popular mm-hmm. then there are few softwares to render 3d models like blender and cascade and occ So it, it it's a tool chain for all all this 3D models. So we, we are using it but we are not there yet. As Pratik also said that I mean AR AR is quite inter- interesting but it I still feel it's in the research phase. There've been lots of research papers in last past past 2 3 years but I I don't think so there are products which actually implement I mean proper AR VR tech yet. So yeah, I think in coming yeah sorry so I think in coming 2 3 years we'll see lots of <coughs> startups utilizing these open source projects and research papers to create something out of it. Yeah and so it's uh, it's awesome that you brought out the uh, the 3D modeling part here. Mm-hmm. I had one question because I'm not so sure whether I categorize it at e- categorize mm-hmm. it as ar vr or mr uh, so the 3d holograms uh, if be there uh, would that be ar vr or mr uh i i'm not sure about this maybe pratik knows better <laughs> yeah uh, it's just a question in my head even i don't uh, know the answer of it ah <laughs> uh, okay 3d hologram okay let me search about it how it looks i am not sure exactly ah okay this is Yeah. Not really Iron Man. I think um uh, Samsung has been there. It has it has started doing the uh, 3D holograms thing. It, it actually uh, displayed a 3D diamond out of its phone screen. I don't know if you know about this. It's it's what I've seen somewhere. And hence um I th- I added an hypothetical saying if be there so if we could bring out 3D holograms how would we categorize it is is something that I want <laughs> Oh Pratik uh, your uh, my you are I think a little bit f- uh, far away from your mic if you could Yeah, yeah much better Yeah it's something that I saw off top of my head even uh, it could be it could be some else company as well but I haven't I mean I could go and search the link and show it to you but it was just off top of my head it's thinking that uh, this is something that I saw I just uh, searched it and it looks really, really cool but what what are the use cases you think for this for this kind of technology like something being popped up from the phone like 
not just phone if, if yeah. you could pop anything mm-hmm. off your screen and make a uh, display a 3d hologram of it uh, mm-hmm. like like you brought up 3d modeling right you brought up right. a 3d model of a building let's say or any of those that sort of thing where you are exploring some plan of some kind of a structure right it, uh. you could uh, better see that with a 3d hologram rather than a screen mm-hmm. Yeah, it's only really better to showcase. Yeah, Akash. Hey, hi. Uh, hi. I am actually Pratik Kuli. Oh, hi. So, uh, a use case of 3D hologram, I feel, uh, I, I like, I can recall in 2014 uh, election, mm-hmm. uh, Modi had used this 3D hologram uh, to reach out to certain couple of places where he couldn't reach out directly. so there were uh, rallies uh, held with the help of this technology where 3d hologram was projected on stage uh, for mr narendra modi and he had given speeches oh that's right uh, sorry I to stop now. you guys there but yeah. uh, for ostaf basically narendra modi is india's current prime minister and he has been for the past few years basically uh, yeah you guys continue uh prasad yeah, you are saying something oh so, yeah, so, sorry and no I, i just remembered another example from silicon valley series so there was if you guys have seen silicon valley uh they've used ar vr to generate a large uh like hologram of one person there it it was quite good i mean <laughs> Yeah that's uh I mean yeah, we do see a lot of fictional use cases for AR VR yeah, which we exactly. become to Yeah exactly those are right but I mean what problem does it solve I mean yeah. like that that I was a bit curious Yeah mm-hmm. uh, Madhavi you were unmuted for a while would you like to say something Yeah so there's this uh, platform built by NASA uh it works on the same principles of ar vr so you could virtually uh, view the martian uh, land so if you guys are interested you could check it out uh, there's also this company who has built that kind of a system to view the uh, space habitats that we could build and uh, i think that there was also a game associated to it Uh, I cannot remember the name of the company. <coughs> Search and let you guys know. But there was this thing wherein you could uh, view the space habitat from the inside, uh, and know what's there for the future for the humanity. Wow, that sounds crazy. <laughs> so, Madhu, uh, regarding the game, Pokemon Go was also a game related to AR VR, right? It used the same technology. Okay. Uh, are you aware about this game uh, pokemon go yeah just to uh, acknowledge what you said uh, pokemon go is something that is specifically aimed at the part of uh, mr which is a mix to be okay yeah uh madhavi um, would you like to share something else i was about to bring the same question to ostap about uh, what he has been using and things ar could be yeah, added yeah yeah you can go ahead Yeah, Osta, uh, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Like, what do you think a d- a daily app that you use where you could add and we are to improve your experience? Uh, I saw one use case for IR. It was guiding people for specific location. It can be useful in some taxi apps or maps applications. Oh right. Uh, I think Google Glasses used to do that, right? They used to project the image of I mean the current navigation pathway to your glasses. I mean of course Google Glass got discontinued but <laughs> when they were still alive. Yeah, that's right. I would just want to acknowledge that as well. Yes. It was out of the it was before the time but it was a true gem in this field basically with the extended opportunities for small scale medium scale and the large scale uh, app and software enterprises it was fantastic and i think they would be launching it pretty time soon they just i think they just integrated to us uh, in the last google summit just had before last week i think 
Right, right. I think they displayed something about 3D Google Maps. I don't exactly remember it. I, I had one like, uh, so you guys know Google Street View? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so Google Street View has already lots of images about all the cities and everything, especially in, in Europe and US. So what what are the hurdles for them to create a 3D model of entire city? I, I I'm just curious and asking questions. What do you guys think? Because they have all the images, everything uh, at every 10 feet. So they, they, they can create 3D models easily, right? Of the end city, just like Vice City and yeah. San Andreas, <laughs> just like that. Yeah, I so think. Why haven't made that yet? I think Microsoft Flight Simulator has done that. Like they have made 3D models of most cities via Bing Maps. So Google definitely has the power to do that. But it ah. must be just choice, hmm. I think. Maybe um, they may require government's uh, permissions to create those cities. Yeah, that might be a security problem, right? Yeah. yeah. Actually, an interesting story about that, Microsoft Flight Simulator had to remove some Australian monument, like the that Lotus Temple in Sydney or something. I mean, sorry, the Sydney Opera, shaped like yeah. a lotus, so I confused it with right. Lotus Temple. But yeah, they had to remove them because they didn't have the copyright for them. So oh, th really? that's something interesting, like they can't display copyright material and all that then I guess so, also on the sorry. same note <clears throat> this is actually a very um, cool idea like, if we have augmented reality or AR VR uh, and 3D models of these cities uh, based on AR VR maybe uh, the planning of the city and the development that the municipal corporations or the governments do could be far far better as we would be easily that it, it would be uh, quite easy to envision what exactly is going to be uh, created and how how uh, it is going to solve uh, civic problems so that is that can something be extremely helpful in case if somebody ever does it uh, i do agree on this uh, visualizing the geospatial data that we have through uh, uh, scans scannery images so uh, visualizing the that uh, as a part of mr vr or ar would be really helpful for uh, people you know uh, in uh, bodies related to uh, agriculture or construction maybe something like that right agreed especially i feel like in a place like india where the architecture is i mean the land is a bit more complex because we already have a lot of structures and how do we correctly utilize the rest of the land which is there so i think i mean if there was some sort of visualization tool which uh, like the existing people are not using of course <laughs> then it would be i think we would have much better utilization of the space that we have uh, exactly yeah <laughs> so a very specific problem like this is was the one with construction of metro lights oh, where yeah. even the route of deciding the route of metro and to decide whether it has to be constructed uh, underground, so it, whether it should be a subway metro or whether it should be an overrun metro, it took uh, Pune Municipal Corporation and PCMC Municipal Corporation around two years to decide only this path. What? <laughs> but yeah, Damn. had this been in place, if ARVR was in place, maybe it would have been really easy for them to understand uh, this thing and to make better decisions. Right. Uh, for context, uh, uh, sorry, Ostap, so Pune is a city we are no. in, so Pune recently had some uh, metro constructions ongoing, so that was what Akash Bansodi was talking about right now. Uh, sorry, yeah, Prasad, go ahead, please. No, I, I was just saying, I mean, in India especially has not been mapped using Google Street Views. I, I think there were some security issues back then in 2014 when Google approached uh, our government for mapping our streets. But yeah, I mean, India especially is not yet mapped. We only have 2D views of streets, no, not 3D. Right. And uh, another major that I feel is uh, 
how will that vehicle go on indian roads <laughs> and, yeah, exactly. and lots of people will crowd around the vehicle and try to i guess do damage to it or something that can also yeah happen. okay yeah <laughs> that's right right uh, sorry uh, yeah shramik now stay don't leave let me know if you can hear me yeah i, I think it's blipping out in, uh, once in a while i don't know you guys go suddenly all mute and then i have to rejoin oi 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 <laughs> ah <laughs> uh, oh damn okay no problem though so basically um, uh, one use case that i would personally love to see is a uh, basically complex git trees so <laughs> shramik would uh, shramik i guess the rest of you who work with git know, would know what i'm talking about so, <laughs> git is basically a project a uh, version ma- control tool for uh, your code base and the trees basically you can create branches from your current code base and uh, uh, this these set of branches basically create a whole tree so that's what i mean by git tree and yeah, sometimes cool, right? when yeah. you have multiple versions of the same <laughs> Akash, you're working, a large it gets room very complex to visualize what's happening and i feel <laughs> the 2d visualization that i'm actually seeing is not good enough to portray that and blame, blame you know if i could actually, actually go in there and see what changes are there and kind of go back in time and do all sorts of things that would be really the developer guys love bike sharing instead of coding right <laughs> doing <laughs> these types of things i mean yeah, yeah more or less <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um <clears throat> uh, oh stop you were trying to say something augmented reality or virtual reality Yeah. Mhm. Um Oh, Ustad, please go ahead. Basically Pratik was saying like please share your thoughts on this. Um, I don't use these technologies in real life a lot, but I've tried a few games on my phone with augmented reality. Either, honestly. so gave it to my 8 year old brother and he was very entertained by these games it was like really fun oh you see we have this thing on the floor it's almost real <laughs> yeah. yeah it was fun for him at least uh, so what has your experience been with them so far uh yes i use it almost daily you say it about this idea with <laughs> visualizing okay so have you used git yourself change like, tree or uh, do you work like with this? git 
I think it would be really interesting, but yeah. <laughs> so any dev tooling where you see, possibly uh, like where you could look like use VR, you feel AR here. sure I need to think about it uh, more yeah right <laughs> but anything else you feel like you could uh, sorry, benefit from this that? Uh, hey Akash, I don't know. I, I've been blipping out. I think I was. Okay. I I dropped yeah, so off Shramik, a while, so I don't. Would you like, like to talk about I am which like tooling we are dev tooling and AR VR particularly? I guess. Uh yeah. Sorry, I was asking Shramik so, uh, about. So once upon a time, I used to use Gitflow. This could be used. I so guess. So it, it's more or less I would say an aggressive way of um, having your Gitflow oriented like having a featured branch out of a main ah. branch or developer branch and all of that no no so any any tool comes basically anything like i talked about itself. git so anything else you think you use like regularly where you could benefit from think, this technology uh, i guess wherein uh, i would say the the git flow uh, makes you use git uh, much more strictly than you you would use git right away but once you get the habit of git flow you would understand how you'd need to um, uh, how do you how do you how do you how would you be using Git properly? Because it's it's yeah more or less what people would do is mm -hmm. oh okay ARVR and Git. I mean we've already covered the tree part, right? <coughs> <laughs> I mean uh, the tree and and finding commits of it is it's the most. Uh, Difficult. I, mean, right. I wouldn't say. I would say it's. Uh, but I'm particularly asking about uh, AR VR use cases in it. Uh, causing problems in your code base. Yeah. From that, I wouldn't know. Uh, or not just. <laughs> yeah, not just even get anything else like. You might be. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. I mean, uh, as long as everybody is following the uh, the Git flow pattern and and the way, uh, let's say conventional commit pattern. Would be okay, right? Yeah. I I, I mean, feel I mean no continue Shramik. No no no. I was just saying if anything pops up where where in, so uh, I mean that's the most of, important yeah, problem to solve. You feel out, like out of this meeting, I will just ping you up, Akash. Yeah. Alright, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, just sounds just good. I tried one uh, and focus on one, one important aspect that considering the maturity of this industry and considering uh, what are we imagining, we need to understand the most professional AR VR developers for the entire world have less than two years of experience, right? And that is a stage of maturity, basically, what we are imagining. So when we say that how we can implement AR VR, uh, you know, we need to break down the short term goals instead of long term goals and uh, you know this macro technologies which would create actual impact and which would be useful for practical cases. So like Madhvi just said two time minutes back and like Shramik uh, highlighted uh, this useful use cases would be like you know uh, in for the interior industry, architecture industry where you know we can quickly implement this stuff and then there is uh, there will be alternative industry uh, rising based on this parent industry. So, uh, like this, you know, where you can imagine furniture. Akash, you already know uh, the Akash, which you already know that I'm building something like this. Already, you know, where we can uh, imagine how our furniture would look like in a particular room, and we can imagine how particular uh, thing a thing could be furniture, or it, it could be anything. <coughs>
Yes, it's your. Right. right right thanks pratik i think that was a excellent outro from current segment uh, so i think we have talked a lot about ar and vr but i would i mean going for the theme of permissionless learning i would like to ask each one of you like what have you been learning recently and what are some things that you like to share with others from your learnings people might not no code but they might find interesting yeah so superficially guess, so what am i what have been shramik uh, so uh, sorry but I, i'll start with the uh, sorter again uh, so uh, shramik would you do you want to talk about something you have been learning over the past 2 weeks and Golang, right? maybe something and that the rest of us can learn it can be in related to anything and you don't have to but uh, like simplify it for us you can just speak in highly technical terms if you server or server is impacted because of it right so how would you tune your server is somewhere is something that i was looking along the line considering that if you have a linux server you would need to increase the number of file descriptor that you have and then also i was looking into concepts of unix such as everything uh, every process in unix uh, in, in in your operating system has to be considered a file uh, so more or less i was looking into some of the kernel uh, parameters of linux as well just just because i was curious on how you could tune your server to accept more requests or uh parallelly send more requests to different microservices if you have microservices architecture yeah i mean you could yeah you could you could scale your systems right but that would co- be costly so let's say if you have a linux server and you want to scale uh consider a kubernetes pod even let's say so if you want to scale what you'll be do is doing is you'll be adding in more pods uh and if if it if it gets to a point you you'd be adding more nodes to your ks ks clusters right uh, and more often than not if you are not using uh, kubernetes and if you are going with uh, let's say some docker solution or uh, even let's say an ha proxy with different linux server and at the back end so you wouldn't be able to handle the cost of adding more linux servers right right so why not tune in the current server to get them yeah get the maximum output of it yeah uh, prasad please go ahead yeah so <laughs> okay so this week only i've been struggling a lot configuring linux servers so we, we i mean in my company <laughs> we have our backend in one of the ec2 machines so ec2 okay. is a server in yeah. aws for i mean for the elastic computing. people yeah who don't know So I mean I I agree with you I struggle a lot configuring Linux server that's why this week we also thought of going serverless so instead of managing and configuring everything on a bare metal machine or even using elastic beanstalk why not go serverless yes so that that was the point we were thinking and it's quite cheap it's highly scalable so Yeah, I mean, what, what do you guys think about going serverless for the backend and microservices? I think if you have microservice architecture, just go ahead for container as a solution. Uh, so I I have a container. I run that container in EC2 or no, no, ECS. No, no. So but... when I say container as a solution, so CAS solutions, I right away mean Kubernetes at least. At this ah, point. okay. 
Okay, we not we have not scaled that much to have Kubernetes right away, but I'll definitely <laughs> think about it. So you could if even if you don't have Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think you could try and figure out some way in the in which you could just have a single node cluster hosted. I mean that would cost you less than EC2, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's it's always it's it's always a, uh, about like how much use you are making out of your Kubernetes, right? So right. that might just cost you less than your EC2 instance. Mm -hmm. So okay. you can find out pricing. You could go to GCP and see uh, what Kubernetes cluster might cost you. But I think in your use case, at least, it would cost you much less than your EC2 instance because you'll only be having a single node cluster. Uh, right. So I think AWS has EKS, which is similar to GCP service. Right. Okay. I'll use that. And I think uh, like one suggestion I would give you is look at the worst case scenario because if worst case, like if your API suddenly receive a lot of load, in your case, since it's a closed application, you would not. But if it was a public facing application, then like serverless can also bankrupt you quite quickly. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah, there are ways to prevent that as well, Akash. Uh, oh, okay. So there are uh, quite a few configuration that uh, you could put, <coughs> and you could also add policies in which, like, if if a request is hitting your ingress, you wouldn't even allow it to come to your application uh, or or the pod where your application is hosted. So you can add gateway policies, and you can add uh, pod level OPA policies uh, for your application. So. You could have uh, some sort of configuration over there as well, is what I'm saying. Oh, uh, okay. So, uh, would you like to talk about then, like, what you have learned new this week? So, I'm, I'm learning a lot about serverless <laughs> this week. And I really think it's very, I mean, lots of people are switching to serverless now because it's very cheap, it's very easy to manage. So I myself tested few microservices on Lambda this week, and I found it very interesting because, oh. like, I I am using Python backend right now on Fast API, and I could deploy that backend using CI/CD in only few minutes. I mean, I could I could build entire CI/CD pipeline and deploy it to Lambda in few minutes. Oh, okay. So, so, so uh, this is like yeah. So, so you yeah, you mentioned that you're using Fast API, so. Yeah, uh, I guess you're using some sort of a framework or a build pipeline on top of that to convert all of those functions to serverless functions, I guess. So, uh, so fast API is ASGI based server, right. and there are a few. So, like if you know Gunicon or WSGI, yeah, so these are the servers which handle requests and pass on to the Flask. Right. So similar to. Uh, like WSGI, we have servers for Fast API also. So uh -huh. this this server stands in front of Fast API, and we deploy this server on Fast API. I mean, I not I mean not deploy as such, but we just upload those code packages to Lambda, and it works. Okay. So we don't need to handle any servers, Apache, Nginx, Unicorn, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> That's quite interesting. You should actually share it. I mean, there's no real option to share it, but I guess I'll share it on Twitter or something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. <clears throat> but the point which you said, it, I mean, it can bankrupt company. It's really right. I didn't really think of it. Yeah. But we have to mention some limit limiters or something <laughs> on mm. AWS. Yeah. Uh, Akash. Uh, sorry, I'm taking your surname also because I'm also named Akash, so <laughs> to keep it less confused, would you like to talk about something you have been learning recently that you want to talk about or share with us? Uh, Akash, are you there? Uh, I guess he must have gone off offline. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ostap, do you want to share with us your next in line about what you've been learning the, the, these past two weeks? Um, it's hard to remember 
what I've done for such a long time because I usually don't remember what was a few days ago but <laughs> I remember I've seen one video about Kubernetes once and I was rewriting my old authentication app into Vue.js and Vita Okay, like a white JS, I guess, right? The latest framework that I was oh, building. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, anything new you learned from that? Like, which the rest of us might not know about? Um, I haven't done much research about it, so I'm currently just trying it. Okay. Uh, so, why? basically <laughs> i mean this uh, this might be too complex even for the tech folks basically like we have build runners like webpack white is just like one of them but it's supposed to be faster uh, and the same guy who made vue.js is working on it to i think increase the speed of his own framework basically so i uh, yeah i think uh, i mean you've talked about ar and vr but I else that you might want to share about you've been learning recently uh, so akash i think we like we spoke yesterday mm -hmm. we started learning figma and uh, like you very well suggested we can someday talk about figma in detail i would able to under, uh, i would able to get knowledge from you guys because you are already using it practically and i would also be i would also like to share with uh, other non-tech people that how one can start with the Figma. You know? I mean, you will be obviously like a better person to talk about this, but yeah, I mean, I just started learning Figma. Yeah, it's I mean, fantastic for anyone to deep dive into product management. Yeah, yeah. Also, like uh, uh, the ones who are learning a technology can explain it better than the ones who are experts in it because the ones who are learning know how they are learning. However, like. I mean, one thing I've felt about web technologies about Re or even React is that I can no longer explain to anyone how I learned it because it was so long ago that I just know how to learn the newer concepts which are but someone who's just new and, you know, beginning to learn it, I, they're generally better able to explain the thing, new things basically, that's what I feel. Uh, Madhavi, would you like to talk about what you've been learning recently in the past two weeks and anything interesting that you could share with us? Uh, not anything new, but yeah, I've been working on my research paper for a while and uh, I saw Akash has been learning Figma and uh, uh, I, I thought of it to not uh, be as useful uh, to me as much uh, as for the UI UX folks, but then, uh, yeah, I think uh, writing the papers, uh, I do need some visuals uh, in the form of charts and uh, flow charts and pie charts. So it was really difficult for me to build it in Canva or in uh, a Windows PowerPoint, but I think uh, Figma would be useful for me and I am hoping to start it start learning it as soon as possible and implement it and I think the results uh, that Akash and Pratik are getting from learning it are very awesome so yeah I hope I would uh, implement it as soon as possible too not anything interesting that I've been learning so far uh, just brushing, brushing up on the concept that I learned during my undergrad uh, for the articles that I'm building right now and also uh, this is something that I it took me a while to uh, decide but then uh, I am uh, also hoping to pursue masters next year so I'm also start starting to prepare for it yeah that's that's in the pipeline for now cool cool so I guess I'll go last so uh, what I had been uh, doing over the past two weeks is what's in the title guy like I was trying to uh, basically I had read some that if you're going to be championing a framework like I work in react I talk about react all of this stuff but if you don't know why it should be there or 
you know what how is it built why should you champion it like why shouldn't people go for the fundamental fundamentals of web development yes so in my case i knew about i mean I'm, i would say a kind of an expert in the fundamentals already and so react was something which i picked on after i like went through the fundamentals and after a few years i started with react so i already knew the fundamentals quite well but still to explain it i mean uh why it was actually useful to understand myself also like i tried to rebuild react from scratch and basically i mean primarily use state and use effect which are like two of the main hooks which are the basis of modern react i feel and uh, th- those are the hooks which actually attracted me and to get started with react so i tried to build the, those from scratch and i learned a lot of things about how orders of like the order of hooks mat- matter and how uh react actually structures and dispatches your function calls so internally actually uh, most of i mean some guys might be knowing but react is an operating system in itself and all of the state and effects that you are running are like processes within that operating system and then it has its own dispatcher so if you want to build something like react you also have to build your own dispatcher and without that dispatcher i mean all of these concepts can run so there is like a lot of layers inside react which one can learn about if they want but it's quite hard to go through it by like oneself i guess you definitely have to read a lot of material and i mean that's what i've been doing recently <laughs> yeah a uh, prasad I, i guess you're nice yes. to know akash yeah thanks for that uh, uh, akash i i just wanted to know how do you learn i mean if you wanted to learn a new framework what do you prefer learning documentation and reading through it or immediately starting to do something like just open a hello world project and start doing something yeah honestly I'm both things like i would just start i would go to the documentation go into get it started and see what the first mm-hmm. command to run it is then i'll run that command and get started with the project and see what the scaffolding the project has built for me and like mm-hmm. play with a few things like making a counter or you know making api call and then displaying image on the screen or something like that so mm-hmm. that's what i would do yeah that's good approach but uh, honestly I, like mm-hmm. this i mean this comes with the background that i already know about web development so if one is learning from scratch i feel like the journey would be quite different for them yeah exactly yeah right i mean uh, the i i usually follow the latter way where i immediately start doing something but i feel it's not the best way to do because reading a documentation before doing something it's usually helpful and that's the approach i'm going to try when i'm learning a new thing next time yeah yeah definitely but <laughs> at least for me documentation only can be boring so <laughs> i try yeah. to build things at the same time yeah true i I'm, i'm learning to i'm trying to learn react a bit so i can collaborate well with the front end guys at least i should know what they're working on and all <coughs> the basic stuff like hooks and everything right right i think like if you're starting with react use state and use effect the only two things you need to learn, know about <laughs> and the rest of the books are if you go into custom hooks right you'll see that underneath all they're doing is just calling use state and use effect in a different way oh really okay yeah <laughs> cool <laughs> Oh yeah, I guess that's it from my side. Is there anything else that anyone else can share? I mean, anything you want to discuss no, or talk about? From my side, Akash, but it was brilliant today. It was a good session. It, this is my first time. Yeah. Permission less learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right then, I guess. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah uh, sorry, Ak- Akash Bansari, were you about to say something? I'm not sure. offline i guess it's still offline but yeah anyways yeah, uh, yeah I, i feel like this was a good session to we learned a lot i mean uh i, I put in three topics in the title there because i thought we would get time to talk about those but yeah i mean everyone seemed really 
excited about AR and VR. So that took up the time, which is great. Maybe next time we'll talk about space tech or something else. I'm curious to know more about space tech because it's kind of new. Yeah, yeah, especially yeah. space tech in India. I could probably write the title of what's new in space tech in India and then a lot of people yeah. will join it. Yeah. <laughs> Even I was going to add that, uh, so basically we had planned today to talk about space tech, but we couldn't, uh, but uh, anyways, uh, we, we can keep a focus session on this space tech because even I am individually interested in space a lot. Uh, the emerging technologies, upcoming technologies, and what's exactly going on in this industry. We read a lot, but we actually don't know the, the scenario. So I'm really interested to know about space tech. Yeah, yeah, same. All right, then, guys, this was a good session. See you in two weeks, I think. Or if anyone else wants to, I mean, conduct a session of their own on this club, I think you're free to do that also. So, yeah, see you guys. Have a nice weekend. See. Have a nice weekend. See you.